In this video, I'm going to discuss JK flip-flops in detail. I'll start with an overview of the functionality of JK flip-flops, explaining their general operation. Then I'll demonstrate how we can build a JK flip-flop using NAND gates. I'll start with a very basic implementation and demonstrate that it doesn't work very well. To fix the problems, I'll then build an edge-triggered and pulse-triggered implementation. When I build a pulse-triggered circuit, which involves a master-slave configuration, I will also demonstrate how we can add asynchronous set and reset inputs to the circuit. So the first questions have to be, what is a JK flip-flop and what do we need them for? Well, a flip-flop at its simplest is a circuit that can remember the number one and zero. We'll call this one or zero that's been remembered the state of the flip-flop. And this is going to be remembered for a fixed period of time. Once we start talking about time and circuits, where the previous state can have an impact on the current state, we're talking about sequential logic. This is different than combinational logic, where the current output is entirely dependent on the current inputs. We need flip-flops, such as the JK flip-flop, to build many different types of blocks within a computer system, such as program counters and certain memory types. So first off, let's look at the basic block operation of a JK flip-flop. Here's a simplified version of a JK flip-flop. The symbolic representation is on the left-hand side and the truth table is on the right-hand side. You'll see many different versions of this truth table, but they all are exactly the same. The symbolic representation shows three inputs and two outputs. For the moment, we're concerned primarily with the J and K input and the Q output. We can ignore the exact operation of the clock for the moment, but assume that it has to be present for a state change to take place. Similarly, the Q bar output can be ignored, as in a JK flip-flop, it is always the reverse of the Q output. We'll see later on that it's handy to have an inverted output, but it can essentially be ignored for the moment. So let's start the flip-flop off. We'll start by placing it in reset form. This means that the flip-flop essentially stores a zero. The value that it stores is the Q output. The way that we place the flip-flop in reset form is to apply J is equal to zero and K is equal to one, and the clock pulse. If we now set J is equal to zero and K is equal to zero, the JK flip-flop will go into its latch state. This means that it will simply store the last value that was in the flip-flop, the zero, as long as J is equal to K is equal to zero. This means that we store the value of zero forever, as long as the inputs are both zero. If we then try the set condition, we apply the input j is equal to one and k is equal to zero. This causes our flip-flop to store a one, that is q is equal to one. If we go back into latch state, then this value will be remembered forever, as long as j and k are kept with the value of zero. So this is why time is important and we call this sequential logic as the current value that we remember when we go into our latch state is the previous value that we had in the flip-flop. So we can rewrite our truth table slightly to more accurately describe the latch state by saying that the state of Q at the time N is the state of Q at the time N minus one. So time is being described by an integer step. If you can imagine a very slow computer with a one second clock cycle, we would say, for example, Q5, the state of Q at 5 seconds, equals Qn minus 1, equals Q5 minus 1, equals Q4, which will be the state of Q at 4 seconds. So n minus 1 from 5 is 4. The final state is when we apply j is equal to 1 and k is equal to 1 at the same time. This is a condition that makes our JK flip-flop very useful and, and much more useful than the SOR flip-flop. This is our toggled state. We had a one stored in our flip-flop, so the toggle state re will reverse this and then store a zero in our flip-flop, again meaning Qn is equal to zero. If we apply another clock pulse to our JK flip-flop, then this will reverse again, meaning we now have a one stored. We can more accurately describe the toggle state by saying Qn equals Qn minus one bar. That is to say that the current state of Q is the inverted form of the previous state of Q. We also write the opposite of this for the QN bar column. So that is the fundamental operation of a JK flip-flop. One thing that I skipped over was the clock input to the flip-flop. 
We'll look at how we can build a flip-flop using NAND gates and we'll see different types of clocking arrangements. However, while we're looking at the symbolic representation of the JK flip-flop, it's useful to mention that there are two main types, either positive or negative edge triggering. Negative edge triggering is where the flip-flop state change, that's QN minus one to QN, is triggered on the negative or falling edge of a clock cycle. This is when the clock is transitioning from a one to a zero. The symbol for this JK flip-flop has a little circle in front of the clock input to make it clear that it is negative edge triggered. A positive edge triggered flip-flop triggers the state change on the rising edge of the clock signal, that is going from a zero to a one value. You'll notice that there's no little circle on the clock input in the symbolic representation of the JK flip-flop here. The final features that may also be present on a JK flip-flop is the asynchronous reset and or set inputs. These are typically active low inputs, meaning that they are not active when the line is high, but are active when you apply a zero on the inputs. I call these inputs asynchronous. That's because the clock is not relevant to their operation. Asynchronous means not at predetermined or regular intervals. So, if you apply a zero to either input, it has an instant effect on the output of the flip-flop. So if you apply a zero to CLR bar, it will instantly set the value in the flip-flop to zero, even without applying a clock pulse. We'll see more on this in the video later. This is my first circuit to implement the JK flip-flop. Here I'm using a 7473. This is a pre-packaged dual JK flip-flop that's negative edge triggered and it has an asynchronous reset input. The fact that it's dual means there's two JK flip-flops on this IC. To wire this up I've used four switches. This is my clock input that's going through a Schmidt trigger. I have a separate video on debouncing an SPST switch that explains the reason for the Schmidt trigger and the RC pair. Suffice to say this provides my clock pulse into my, into my uh, JK flip-flop here. I have my J input and my K input. These are both normally low, so the default situation is that the clock is low, J is low, and K is low. This one is slightly different. This is an asynchronous reset input, and this is normally high. When I press the button, it pulls the, um, the circuit low, and we get an asynchronous reset. That's because the asynchronous reset input is active low, as just discussed previously. I also have my output indicators. This is my Q and my Q bar. So at the moment we can say that the Q bar is high, so therefore this um, JK flip-flop is in its reset state. So let's have a look at pressing the buttons and seeing what happens. If I press the clock, nothing happens. And that's because, well, at the moment we have a zero zero input into the JK flip-flop, so therefore it's in latch state. If I press J or K, we have no effect on the circuit because we need a clock signal to drive that J or K value uh, through the, uh, the flip-flop. If I press the asynchronous reset, for the moment it has no effect because we're already in reset state. If I was to press my J input and then clock it true by pressing down and see the clock signal is high and then it goes low. So that you can see means that we're, we're going from a negative. So we went from a, a high to a low. So that's a negative edge trigger. You can see the effect is that we've now stored a one in this particular flip-flop. So we can say that this, because it's negative edge triggered, you can see it's when the clock signal is falling. If I want to store a zero in the, in the flip-flop, I would again clock through a value and we would now be storing a zero. The other condition we have with this flip-flop is that we can set both switches at the same time to be one, so therefore both switches are high, and then we're able to uh, press a clock pulse true. And again, on the trailing edge or the falling edge of the clock cycle, you can see that it toggles the state. So I have J is equal to one, K is equal to one, and applying a clock pulse. The final one I want to show you is the asynchronous reset input. If I press this button, without any clock input, it resets the flip-flop to zero. And that's just a special feature that's available on this particular flip-flop. As I said before, some flip-flops have asynchronous set, some have asynchronous reset, some have both. The next thing I'm going to do is look at building a JK flip-flop using NAND gates. NAND gates are particularly useful for this because we can build an entire flip-flop just using that type of gate. These circuits are surprisingly complicated. The feedback lines mean that you have to really think about how these circuits work. 
and I'll go through slowly, state by state, to explain how the circuits work. So let's quickly remind ourselves about the NAND gate. The NAND gate is simply an AND gate followed by an inverter, not AND. So if we look at our truth table on the right hand side, we can see we have our A and B inputs to the NAND gate and F is our output. What I want to concentrate on is the zeros going in on the left hand side. This gives us an important property. We can see in A we have two zeros and B we have two zeros as we would expect, but look at the output whenever A or B has an input of zero. We can say that for a NAND gate, if any input is zero, the output is one. The only way that we get an output of zero for a NAND gate is when both inputs have values of one. And I'm going to use this property to explain how flip-flops work. This is the first stage of our JK flip-flop, and we're simply going to connect two NAND gates together in this configuration. The configuration is that the output of the first NAND gate is applied to the input of the second NAND gate, and the output of the second NAND gate goes into the input of the first NAND gate. It's important to remember, as we just discussed with NAND gates, that if either input is zero, then the output is one. So input of zero, output of one. And that's, that's the rule that we're going to use to work out how this particular circuit works. So let's look at our truth table to, to work out all the possible combinations in this case. If we have A is equal to zero and B is equal to one, A is zero and B is equal to one. I've called them A and B just not to, so I don't confuse it with any other flip-flop configuration. But well, we know if any input is zero, the output is one. So therefore, the input to this NAND gate here is zero, so therefore its output must be one. The one feeds back in here, and we have an input of one, one to our second NAND gate, which is an output of zero. The zero goes back in here, and we have an input of zero, zero, which gives us an output of one, which means we now have a stable, um, the feedback has, has been provided, and we now have a stable configuration. So we can say, that this is one, zero is our output here. So let's look at, let's jump down to the last state for a second. Let's look at one, one. So one, one. So after we apply, we, and we have a one, zero on our output of this particular circuit, we apply a one, one. So again, we know that if any input is zero, the output is one. So let's assume that we have our one, and zero currently present on the output of our circuit, this is from coming from the red ones, the one goes back in here, the zero goes back in here, and if we look at the orange inputs here of one zero as an input into our, into our NAND gate here, that gives us an output of one, because we've got a zero present, we have an output of one. One one gives us an output of zero. So you can see that, in effect, we had no change, and that's important, and we'll see that in a minute. So if we apply one one, well, I, I, the temptation is to write one zero here, but that's not correct. So I'm just gonna say, well, if we had a one zero stored in our flip-flop at that point, and we apply one one, we get one zero. Okay, let's go on to the next state. So let's look at one zero as an input to our circuit now. So one zero, A is equal to one, B is equal to zero, and let's look at the effect again zero input to the second flip-flop, we have a zero input, so therefore we have an output of one. The one goes back in here, one, one is our input, output of zero. Zero goes back in here, zero, zero in green are our inputs to our second NAND gate, output of one. So this is stable at, at this point now. So we can say that the output in this case is zero, one. Okay, that's what we would expect. Let's change the color again. So now let's look at a situation where we apply 1-1 one, one again. So I'm going to apply 1-1 one, one back to this circuit again. So we're going to remember, we're going to look at what's currently present. So there's a 0 and a 1 present there at the moment. So let's just write that in blue just to be clear about it. 0 and 1 present. The 0 feeds in here. The 1 goes back in here. 1-1 one, one in blue are the inputs to our top gate, so uh, to the top NAND gate. So 1-1 one, one as an input to an AND gate gives us an output of 0, so that confirms that state. If we apply 0-1 as the input to our NAND gate, second NAND gate, we get an output of 1, which confirms that state. So what we're saying is that if we had a 1-0 and we apply a 1-1, one, one, we get 1-0. If we had a 0-1 and we apply a 1-1, one, one, we get a 0-1. Which means that, in effect, we get no change when we apply 1-1. One, one. So we'll call this no change. 
Another way of saying that is to call it latch. So it latches true. There's no change when we apply 1-1. One, one. The final one to look at is, is the uh, top row of our, our true type, so 0, 0. And this one's problematic because if we apply a 0, 0 to the inputs to our two NAND gates, well, if either input is 0, the output is 1. So that means a 0 into a NAND gate, it doesn't matter what the input is here or what the input is here. 0 into a NAND gate gives us an output of Q is equal to 1. 0 into a NAND gate, regardless of what comes back, gives us an output of Q bar is equal to 1. So at the moment now, if we apply an input of 0, 0, we get Q is equal to 1, and we get Q bar is equal to 1. And that's not good, because that says that Q is equal to Q bar, which is invalid. So we call this invalid. Okay, so that's an invalid input. So there, that's the basic configuration of this flip-flop. We could say that when we apply 0, 1, we can say that Q has a value of 1, so we could also call this set. When we apply 1, 0, we get an output of 0, 1. We call this reset. When we apply a 1, 1, we get no change, and 0, 0 is invalid. And that's the basic operation of this particular part of our JK flip-flop, so we need to bring this truth table now to the next stage. This is the full JK flip-flop circuit that we're going to examine in a minute. However, before I look at this, I want to talk about the pulse generator on the left of the circuit. The pulse generator generates very short, high pulses when a particular condition arises. And in our circuit, that would either be a positive or a negative clock edge, depending on which we require. But first, why do we need short pulses? Well, in this circuit, we have two cross-coupled feedback lines that run from Q bar and Q back into J and K, respectively. In this circuit, we only want these lines to be active for a very short amount of time. So to achieve this, we run our very short pulse into two three input NAND gates. For this very short amount of time, the two three input NAND gates will be active and the feedback from Q bar and Q along with the J and K values will determine the values of A and B. The values are passed to our internal flip-flop circuit and almost immediately the pulses go low and the two three input AND gates are turned off, meaning that we don't get any additional feedback change while the signal is propagating through the gates to the right of the inputs A and B. So how do we build a pulse generator? Well, first for a positive edge triggered pulse generator, we want to generate a pulse when the clock goes from zero to one. To do this, we use a very simple circuit, a AND gate with an inverter on one of the legs and the inputs tied together. Because I'm using NAND gates in my physical implementation, I'm going to use a, a NAND gate with two legs tied together, and this is exactly the same as an inverter. So how does it work? Well, it takes advantage of a physical characteristic of our logic gates, the propagation delay. You see in a circuit at the top, we have a zero input. It is inverted on the top to a one, and we're ANDing one with zero, so we get an output of zero. However, when we change the input to a one, the bottom path instantly feeds a 1 to the input of the AND gate, but in the top path it takes time for the 1 to change into a 0 due to the propagation inherent in all gates. This can be as low as typically 10 nanoseconds, but let's say for this 10 nanoseconds there's a 1, 1 input into our AND gate which results in an output of 1 for these 10 nanoseconds, and this is our short pulse. One problem is that different logic families have different propagation delays. For example, LS, the low-power Schottky, has a propagation delay of 10 nanoseconds, whereas HCT, CMOS, has a propagation delay of 9 nanoseconds. TTL could be as long as 33 nanoseconds, and AC, CMOS, can be as low as 3 nanoseconds. I'm mixing different logic families in my implementation, so instead of one single inverter, I have to use three in a row for the circuit to work correctly. Finally, for a negative edge-triggered uh, pulse generator, we wish to generate a clock pulse on the negative edge of the clock signal. To achieve this, we use the exact same circuit, but place an inverter on the clock output itself. So here's my full edge triggered JK flip-flop. We've just discussed this area here in the dotted area. We've just discussed that as our, as our smaller flip-flop circuit where we have an A and B input and our Q and Q bar output. And we derive this truth table here 
for A and B, when we had 0, 0, it was invalid or not allowed. We want to get rid of that condition and we'll see we're able to do that now. We have 0, 1, when A is 0, we get an output of Q is equal to 1. When A is 1, 0, we have an output of Q is equal to 0, Q bar is equal to 1. And when we have an input of A is equal to 1, B is equal to 1, we get no change. So that's this subpart of the circuit here, and I'm going to work under that, the fact that we've already shown how that is the case. The first thing to look at is our clock, and to see, well, our clock in this situation, we've designed the circuit so that we have a very small pulse, and we're concerned with the fact that we go from 0 to 1 and 0. So our, our clock output here, if you like, we have a very, it's, it's mainly at 0, and it just transitions from 0 to 1. And that's what we're concerned with, this positive edge on, on our pulses. Um, the reason that this is important is because the majority of the time our clock is going to be low. And remember, with a NAND gate, if the input is 0 or low, the output is 1. So we can say for the majority of time when the clock is low, we have an input of 0 into both of these NAND gates, which means we have an output of 1 and an output of 1. Uh, so A is equal to 1 and B is equal to 1. And the importance of that is, well, if we look at our sub-circuit here, we can see 1, 1 for A and B, it means we have no change or latch. So when the clock is low, we get no change on our output. And that's the first important part of our circuit, our circuit configuration. So let's look at one of the states on, on, our, on our circuit. So let's look at 0, 1. So I'll change the color. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll keep the color and I'll just get rid of what I've just drawn. So let's look at j is equal to 0 and k is equal to 1. So j is equal to 0 and k is equal to 1. And let's look at the situation where, for example, we, we have an output of 0, 1 already. Let's look at that situation. So if we see here, j comes in here. So the, again, if any input is 0, let's assume that our clock is high and just for that we're at the top of our pulse. So we have a 1 coming out of our pulse. So we have j is equal to 0. Uh, which automatically means, and let's look at our feedback, we have 1 coming back here, and from our Q, this is feeding back here, and we're getting a 0 back here. So we have a situation where the first NAND gate is 1, 0, 1 are our inputs to our NAND gate, which means that we get an output of A is equal to 1. 1, 1, 0, again we have 1 input is 0, so we have an output of 1. So in the situation where we had 0, 1 on our input and 0, 1 on our output, we get 1, 1 in, which is no change, which means that the output is going to be 0, 1. So 0, 1 for our input gives us 0, 1 on our output. Now, you may ask, what would happen if we didn't have 0, 1 here, if we had 1, 0 as the output? It just so happened that the previous state was 1, 0. Well, if we look at that situation, so 0, 1 comes in, and now we have, instead of, instead of uh, a 0 coming back, we have a, a 1 coming in here this time, and instead of having a, a 1 coming in, we have a 0 coming in. So let's see what happens in this situation. Again, our clock is high for a very short amount of time. So if any of the inputs are 0, the output is 1, so that's the same. But in this situation here, we've got 1, 1, 1 as the input to our second NAND gate. So all the inputs are 1, so therefore the output is 0 in this situation. So the input, A is equal to 1, B is equal to 0. And if we look at our, our, our sub-circuit, this is the output that we get. A is equal to 1, B is equal to 0. That gives us an output of 0, 1. So that's our output, 0, 1 which is consistent with what we got the last time. So we can say that in the situation where J Q or Q is equal to 1 or Q is equal to 0, if we apply a 0, 1 as our input for J and K, we get an output of 0, 1 for Q and Q and 1 for Q n bar. So let's change the color again. And let's look at the situation where we have J is equal to 1 and K is equal to 0. So we'll do the exact same thing again, just to, just to be clear about how it works. But we'll do it this time for J is equal to 1, K is equal to 0. So let's assume in this case, well, let's, let's work the same way around. So we can say, well, in the situation where we had an output of Q is equal to 0 and Q bar is equal to 1, we'll look at both, both possibilities again. 
So in this case here, we have one gets fed back around here. So we've got one coming in here, we have a zero coming around here, and we have our clock pulse is high. So the out input to the first NAND gate here is one, one, one. One, one, one gives us a zero output of our first NAND gate. And one, zero, zero gives us an output of um, one for our, uh, I'll just put a circle around it just to make it clear. So A is equal to zero, B is equal to one, a is equal to zero, B is equal to one. That gives us an output here of one, okay, and an output of zero. Okay, so that's our outputs that we get in that situation. So just write that in. In the situation where J is equal to one and K is equal to zero, we get an output of one, zero. Okay, let's look at the situation. I'm, I'm just gonna do it in blue uh, where Q wasn't in the in the previous state it wasn't zero one it was one zero so we apply one zero and we apply the same input one zero on our on our for, for J and K so we want to confirm that even if the previous state was uh, wasn't this wasn't Q is equal to zero it was Q is equal to one what's our output in this situation so if you look here we've got a one coming in here the same as before it but in this case here we have a zero coming around, so we have a zero instead of a one this time, okay? And in this situation here, we have a one coming around, so we have a one coming in this time here. So in the same way as the last time, we have zero, one, one, which is, it means we get an output of one for A. That's getting a bit messy. We have one, zero, one coming in here, so we have a zero, so the output is gonna be one. So we have an output of one, one for the, from these two NAND gates. One, one as an input to our, our sub-circuit says no change. And since we had a uh, one and a zero, there's no change. So we get confirmation of that one, zero. So in both conditions where either we had a one for Q or a zero for Q, when we apply one, zero as the input to our J and K values, we get an output of one, zero. So we can say that that is confirmed in both situations. So both of those conditions are, are confirmed. Okay, just fill in again what we've, we've already calculated. So zero, one gives us an output of zero, one. One, zero gives us an output of one, zero. So that's, that's where we're starting from. The next one we're gonna look at is zero, zero. So J is equal to zero and K is equal to zero. Uh, well, the important thing to remember here is back down here. If any of the inputs to a NAND gate is zero, then the output must be one, which means straight away, if the input here into this flip-flop is zero, the output must be one. The input into this, this, this NAND gate here is zero, the output must be one. It doesn't matter what the clock does, you know, even if the clock goes high, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what this feedback line is, or it doesn't matter what this feedback line, in fact, I can put an X in here for the clock. It doesn't matter what the clock does either. If we have a zero input into a NAND gate, the output is one. So one, one into this sub circuit we saw before gives us no change. So no change means that Q stays the same and Q bar stays the same. So we can simply say in this situation, if we have an input of J is equal to zero and K is equal to zero at the same time, we have no change. Okay, and that's, and that's that particular state. So we've only got one more to look at, which is one, one. So I'm just gonna, unfortunately I have to delete the whole thing, delete that, so re rewrite this, no change. Uh, zero, one, one, zero. So let's look at the last one. And the last one is where we apply J is equal to one and K is equal to one into our circuit. If our clock goes high, well then it means that we're gonna have a one in here. So what's very important here is what is the output. So let's look at the situation where we have one, zero as the output from our previous state. So one, zero. So the one comes back in here and we have a one coming in here and the zero goes around here and we have a zero coming in here. So here we've got a NAND gate where we've got one, one, one as our input. That gives us an output of zero. 0, 1, 1 as our input to this NAND gate gives us an output of 1. So we've got A is equal to 1, B is equal to 0. A is equal to 1, B is equal to 0 gives us an output of 0, 1. So we've, we've um, switched from a 1 to a 0 and a 0 to a 1. Okay, 
let's look at the situation where we apply another clock pulse. So at this point, let's look at the situation where we, we leave the red where it is. So let's assume that the output of Q is currently zero. The output of Q bar is equal to one. And we apply another clock pulse to our circuit and, and another pulse has been applied. So this, this zero gets fed back here and change it to green. We keep the K is equal to one. We keep our clock pulse high. We have a one coming back in here. We have a one for J, we leave it the same and our clock pulse is high. So I just write that here. So if you look in green now, we've got one, one, one as the input to this NAND gate, which gives us a zero. We have one, one, zero, which gives us an output of one. So now we've got A is equal to zero, B is equal to one. A is equal to zero, B is equal to one, gives us an output of one, zero. And we can keep doing this forever. What happens is very simply, is we get our toggle state. This is because the output for Q has been fed back into the input for K, the output for Q bar has been fed back in for J. And at each clock pulse we apply, we're simply reversing the state of the inner circuit and we're getting this toggle uh, condition, which is the unique characteristic of the JK flip-flop that makes it very useful. Here I've built the JK flip-flop using NAND gates, but I've left out the pulse generation circuit. I'm using a clock that's running through a Schmidt trigger that's used as the input to the, uh, to the JK flip-flop. And you can see here that it works fairly well when I'm setting or resetting the JK flip-flop. However, the big problem arises when we set J is equal to K is equal to 1. In this situation, because the clock is being clocked through and there's no pulse generator on the front side of the clock, it means that the Q and Q bar output lines are active and are feeding back to the input. And this means that we get unpredictable outputs from this circuit. This is my implementation of the edge triggered JK flip-flop. Here you can see that I have my regular JK flip-flop here. It's not in a master-slave configuration that we'll talk about later. It's got an AND gate, and before this I have NAND gates, but essentially I have three NOT gates, um, one after the other going into the AND gate, and I'll explain the operation of that with the diagram. And finally I have my clock input, this button here is my clock input, and this is going through a Schmidt trigger to debounce the clock input before it goes into the inverters, before it goes into the AND gate, before it becomes a clock input to the JK flip-flop. Down here I've got J and K as, as per usual. And this is uh, the configuration I've put in here on the pulse generator is that I'm looking at positive uh, edges on the clock signal. So here uh, the flip-flop is currently in a set condition. If I press K is equal to one and watch on the positive edge of the clock signal, you can see that as I press the button, um, it switched to a reset state. So uh, Q is equal to zero and Q bar is equal to one. If I want to set it again, I press J and press the clock pulse and again it switches over. So it's working correctly. If I press the clock pulse on its own, it has no effect on the circuit, which is the case because in essentially when I press the clock here, we're generating a pulse, but we've got zero, zero as the input. So therefore that's a latch condition on a JK flip-flop. So it just remembers the previous state. So when I press both buttons at the same time, we go into toggle mode and when I press the button, you can see we go from set to reset, and reset to set, set to reset, reset to set. So it works perfectly in toggle mode as well. So this circuit is quite um, stable. It's much more stable than the, previous, than the previous circuit, and that's thanks to this short pulses that we're using here. I found that one NOT gate or one NAND gate wasn't sufficient to drive this, and you might have different experiences of this, but I had to put three uh, not gates uh, one after the other in order to get a pulse that was wide enough to trigger this circuit. The final implementation that I'm going to carry out is a master slave JK flip flop. The master slave is much less common than the edge triggered flip flop, but still it's important that you understand how it works because its internal configuration is quite different than the edge triggered flip flop, despite the fact that it behaves in the same way. I'm also going to take this opportunity to look at the addition of asynchronous set and reset inputs and show you how you would wire these into the master-slave configuration. The master-slave flip-flop is essentially two individual flip-flops. 
the clock input runs to the master and an inverted form of the clock input runs to the slave. This means that on the rising edge of the clock pulse, the master receives the JK values and stores its state. But then on the trailing edge of the clock pulse, this state is transferred through to the slave. The effect of this is that you need to apply a full clock pulse to transfer the inputs from the JK inputs to the Q and Q bar outputs. Okay, here's the master slave configuration. Here's the master flip flop and the slave flip flop. So we're going to look at filling in this truth table again for the master slave flip flop. Again, I have this area here, these, these, this flip flop area here, which is A and B that we looked at before. And I have my truth table here just to simplify the discussion. So if we look at the situation, for example, where we want to do reset the flip-flop, so this is zero, 01, we apply zero for J and a one for K. If, for example, our output was one, zero, well, let's see what would happen in this situation. So the one would come back down this gray line. We have a one here. Uh, we have Q bar is zero. The zero goes around and our clock is gonna go high uh, before it goes low, okay. So we'll look at the high situation first. So the clock goes high and we have 111 one, one coming into this flip-flop or into this NAND gate, which gives us an output of zero. We have zero, zero, 001 coming in here, which gives us an output of one. Um, one zero, in, if we look it up here, one zero for AB is an output of zero, one. So that's our output at this particular, the master, the master flip-flop. So let's assume that at this point that the, the flip, the clock goes low. So the clock goes low and this, this essentially turns off this and turns off this. So the clock is low and this turns on this, this gate here. So it means now our clock is now high. So we have a, we have a one coming in for, for our clock here because of its inverted form. So here we've got zero, one and one, one. So zero, nand, one gives us an output of one and one, nand, one gives us an output of zero. So again, we can refer to our, our table down here. We can see A is one, B is zero. A is one, B is zero. We get an output of zero, one. So that gives us an output in that situation of zero, one. And we'll write that down, zero, one. Uh, if, if it was the case, and I'll just change my pen color, if it was the case that we had initially a zero, one coming in, let's see what happens in that situation. Well, the zero would come down here. The one would go up here. So in this situation here, clock has just gone high. Our input is zero, input is one. One, one, zero gives us an output of um, one. One, zero, one gives us an output of one. So one, one is no change. So that means we get our zero, one on our output. Zero, one on our output is zero, one going in here. Our clock goes high. And you can see we get one zero and we get our output, which is zero one. So that confirms that we also got zero one in that situation. So that's valid there. So we had zero one as our output there. So let's have a look at the situation where we want to go on to one zero. And let's assume that we have zero one again. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So one zero. So our zero comes around and we have a zero going in here. And our one goes around and we have a one coming in here. Uh, our clock uh, is going to go high. So we have one, 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 which gives us an output of zero. One, zero, zero, which gives us an output of one. So zero, one into our, into our gate, zero, one gives us an output of one, zero. Our clock then goes low and is inverted and we end up with a clock that's high. We have an input of one, input of zero. One, nand, one is an output of zero and then one, nan, zero is an output of one. So we have A is equal to zero, B is equal to one. This gives us an output of one, zero. So we've got one, zero as our output. Let's just flick the color again. Let's see what happens if in this situation we did have one, zero on the output when we did this. We apply one, zero to our input here. We see we have feedback from the output, the reds in this time, uh, as a zero. And our one comes back here. Our clock goes high. So we've got zero, one, one, which is an output of one. Uh, one, zero, one, which is an output of one. One, one is no change. So we keep our one, zero, goes into our clock now goes high. So we have one, one going in here, one, one, 
0 going in here, output of 1, output of 0, and we get 1, 0 as our output. So in that situation, we can safely say that 1, 0 is our set condition when we have an input of j is equal to 1, k is equal to 0. Okay, with our output currently at 1, 0, let's have a look at what would happen if we apply the input 0, 0. Okay, so 0, 0. So j is 0, k is 0. Um, we have our feedback. Um, 1 is coming back here. So we have a 1, the green 1 coming in here. 0 is going back here. So the green 0 coming in here. And we have our clock goes high, so we have a green 1. So 0, 0, 1 is an output of 1. 1, 0, 1 is an output of 1. So 1, 1 is no change. So that gives us an output of 1, 0. 1, 0 going in here, then our clock goes high, we end up with a 1, 1 coming in here, 1, 0. Again, we get 0, 1, and we get no change. So we get uh, our output there would be 1, 0. You can take it from me that if, if, if the situation was that we had 0, 1, we would also get no change. So we can describe this here as no change. Okay, so just to look at the last state, which is 1, 1. So in this situation here, we're applying a 1 for our input for j, 1 for k. And let's assume we had, for example, a 1, 0 on our output for q and q bar. It doesn't matter. So the 1 goes round here, and the 0 goes round here, and our clock is going to go high. So that means we'll have uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, which is an output of 1, and 1, 1, 1, which is an output of 0. 1, 0 goes into my flip-flop again, uh, so 1, 0 goes in here and I get an output of 0, 1. Our clock then goes low, and the clock, this means that this goes high. So our clock goes high, so we have 1, 1 and 0, 1 as the inputs into, the, into the, these two NAND gates. So 1, 1 gives an output of 0, 1, 0, output of 1. So now we've got A is 1, B is 0. A is 1, B is 0, gives us an output of 0, 1. Now, we could be tempted to write 0, 1 in here, but uh, we know better. We know from previously that this was going to be our toggle. So let's just have a look at the situation if we apply another clock pulse. So we keep 1, 1 as our inputs, and we're going to apply another clock pulse. The output this time is going to feed back on the grey lines, is that we're going to be applying a 1 back here this time for the, this grey line, and this one here is going to be re returning a 0. So our clock goes high, and we end up with 1, 1, 1 as the input up here, which is an output of 0. 1, 1, 0, which is an output of 1. A is equal to 0, B is equal to 1, and we get an output of 1, 0. So we get 1, 0. Again, the clock goes low, so this inverted clock goes high. So we have a 1, 1 going in here, and a 1, 0 going in here. So 1, 1 gives us an output of 0, and 1, 0 an output of 1. So now we've got 0, 1 going into our second, into our slave flip-flop. So 0, 1 gives us an output of 1, 0. And you can continue this on and you'll see the effect is that you get an inversion as you move. Every time you, you uh, go across and apply 1, 1 on a clock pulse, we get an inversion or toggle. So this works out to be our toggle condition in our, in our master slave JK flip-flop. This is my implementation of the master slave JK flip-flop. Here I have my three inputs, my clock, which has been debounced by the Schmidt trigger and the RC circuit here. I have my J input, my K input, and I'm using these four ICs here to create the master slave configuration. The first IC has three, three input NAND gates. The next one has four, two input NAND gates, two input NAND gates, and two input NAND gates. So these last three ICs are the same. I'm using two of the NAND gates on this IC, two on this IC, three from this IC, and two of the three input NAND gates in this IC. The reason I'm using one extra on this uh, IC is that I'm creating an inverter by tying two of the inputs of a NAND gate together and then reading the value from the output. So this is the configuration, and the reason that I'm using so many ICs is because I want to follow the wiring that's in the diagram. Um, and to do that, I, I'm, you know, I'm only using two uh, gates from this and two gates from this, so I could have combined that into a single IC, but the wiring would be harder to follow. So let's have a look at the operation of this of this uh, circuit. So at the moment, this is my output Q is one, 
and my output of Q bar is zero. So you, you can, for all intents and purposes, say that this, this circuit is storing a logical one. If I press my clock, it has no effect. If I press my J, my J or K, it has no effect on, on the output. If we want to store a zero in this circuit, we can press K and set press K and hold K, so we're given an input of J is zero, K is one, and we can clock true, and this will store the value of zero in our, our flip-flop, uh, essentially store value of zero. If we press K, um, J is equal to one and press the clock again, you'll see that we're now storing a one, or the green light is lit instead of the red light. Um, so that's the, that's the general configuration. When we press the clock, we're inputting zero, zero, so it simply goes into latch uh, condition where it remembers the value from the previous uh, state, so it will continue to store that forever. The final condition that works correctly in this circuit is if I press J is equal to 1 and K is equal to 1, so it's an input of 1, 1, and we clock true. And you can see that when we press the clock pulse, we get the toggle condition, which is if we had a 0, it stores a 1. In the previous case, if we had a 1, it stores a 0. So we can clock true, and we'll see that this circuit works very, very, it's very stable, works correctly, and you can see that um, it, it's, it's working uh, as it should. Next we're going to look at how we can drive this master slave flip-flop with asynchronous set and reset inputs. Uh, I'm going to show you the figure that appears in many textbooks and I think it's incorrect and you can try it for yourself. If we had a 1, 0 as our input for J and K, we get an output of 1, 0 and this would be an output in this case of uh, 1, 0. So this is the state that we'd be in to get into this position where we'd have 1, 0. We'd also have our reset line will be low and our clock would be low at this situation, so clock bar will be 1. So we have 1, 1 on the input to these two NAND gates, so therefore 1, 1 is an output of 0, 1, 0 is an output of 1. Uh, the 1 would feed back in here, and the 0 would feed back in here, uh, and the set will be active high, so we'd have a 1 going in here. So 1, 0, 0 would be an output of 1, 1, 1, 0, uh, 1, 1, 1, sorry, will be an output of 0, and that's correct. So this is active low, so we'd have a 1 going in here. So that's correct. Now let's look at a situation where we apply a zero. So we, we use our active low reset to zero. So a zero comes in here. Zero, one, one gives us an output of one. And it looks like Q bar has been reset. Uh, the one comes back in here and tries to force this and it still stays as a one. You let go of the reset switch, it goes back to one and the output then goes back to zero. So I don't see how this circuit can work even though it's in many of the textbooks. And I've modified this circuit to what I believe is correct. And when I implement it, it works correctly, whereas this circuit doesn't work correctly. So here I've modified the circuit uh, and I've brought the set back in here into the master and I've added in a three input NAND gate here and a three input NAND gate here. And I believe that this circuit now will work correctly. So if we look at the same configuration, nothing really changes initially, so one, zero. Uh, the output of this, as we saw earlier, would be 1, 0. So we have a 1 and a 0 going in here. And this will result in a 1, 0 output from, from our circuit. Uh, our clock, I've, I've had to put in a, a triple input into my clock just because an inverter with two inputs, an inverter with three input, if you're using a triple into input NAND gate, which I had to use because of the change. So our clock is low, so therefore this clock is high. So we have a 1 going in here. So 1, 1 is going in here, output of 0, 1, 0, output of 1. So we're in the same situation, our reset uh, is low, is, sorry, it's high by default, it's active low. And in, in this situation, we get 1, 1, we have a 1 coming back in here, 0 coming back in here, and we're stable with an output of 1, 0. The change that happens is when we now make this reset line low. So if we look at the effect of this on our circuit, the reset line going low means we have a 0 coming in here, and we have a 0 coming in here. Now the effect of the zero coming in here is, as soon as we see a zero on an input to a to a flip to to an AND gate, we know the output has to be one. So instead of a zero going in here, uh, we've got a one. The one goes in here, and it doesn't matter what the you know we've we've got our we had a one. So let's look at what we've got here. We've got a uh, a one coming back here, and uh, we have one zero zero. So we have a one going in here. So this gives us an output of zero. The zero goes in here. And that's fine, still an output of 1. So 0, 1, this is carried forward, 0, 1. 
our clock is 1, and this is 1. So 0, 1 is an output of 1, and 1, 1 is an output of 0. So you can see here, 0, 0 coming in here means we have an output of 1. The 1 goes back in here, 1, 1, 1, output of 0. And now when we go back to a high state, you'll see that that state is preserved. If you follow it back again, you'll see that we end up keeping an output now of 1, uh, sorry, in this case, we get 0, 1. So we've, got, we've reset uh, the flip-flop circuit when we applied a low for the reset input. Okay, this is my circuit. This is my uh, master slave JK flip flop with asynchronous reset and preset inputs. Up here I've got my preset and down here I've got my reset. Uh, my flip flop is the same as before except for I've done, made a few changes. I've changed this uh, from two input NAND gates to be three input NAND gates and I've done the same with this I see here. That means that I've got triple input AND gates in two locations which I'm feeding uh, through my um, two switches. We can see that the circuit behaves almost exactly the same, or, well exactly the same over here. If we want to set it we have to hold and we have to apply a full clock pulse, it has to go from low to high to low. If we want to reset it we do the same uh, only with the K input selected high. If we want to toggle we press J and K to be high and we apply a full clock pulse and that toggles across uh, at, at each time we apply a clock pulse. So the flip-flop behaves exactly the same. Now remember in the situation where we apply, we just press the J or K buttons, nothing happens and that's because we have to apply a clock pulse for, for them to be active. The advantage of the asynchronous um, reset input is that we don't need a clock pulse, we just simply press it and instantly it's changed to have that output. We also know that if we were to continue and go back to our, our regular operation, we can see that it behaves exactly the toggle condition works just the same. If we were to use our preset, well that has the same effect only in this case it sets um, our Q value to be high. So this is asynchronous set and preset inputs. In both cases these are active low, so that's why I've used pull up resistors on the output side of the switch which means that I'm applying a 1 for both of these switches and it's only when I press the button that I apply a 0. Um, so we call, we call these active low inputs. So that's the circuit. Um, it works the same as before with the exception with this, new, with this new functionality as well. That was a fairly lengthy video on JK flip-flops. Uh, we started by looking at the 7473 packaged version of a JK flip-flop. And that's going to be the basis of a further video on flip-flop applications where we build counters, for example. But it's no harm to know how a flip-flop works, and to do that we had to look inside a flip-flop and see how we could implement a flip-flop using NAND gates. The edge-triggered version that we looked at initially is the most common version of the, this flip-flop used, but I think it's also useful to see the master-slave JK flip-flop and see how it works too especially in relation to the asynchronous set and reset inputs which are useful to understand. Hopefully you enjoyed the video and when the follow-up flip-flop applications video is available I'll make a link available here but you can follow the link back to the main uh, YouTube channel page where you can see the other videos that are available in this series.